Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 1030 panel going pro, the darker and or lighter side of quitting your job and doing what you love. My name is Nicole Deaker, my band is Hello the Future, I am the only person in my band. I have been a performing musician for three years, I quit and went pro about ten months ago and I've been in the black every month. We'll talk about me later because I'm actually moderating this panel so I should talk about these other fantastic people. I'm going to pass the mic down the line and everyone can introduce themselves. Hi everybody, my name is Dan Roth. I'm a freelance writer. I work for the Sci-Fi Channel. I also do a webcomic. Uh, I actually just officially quit my day job. I used to work as a comic book clerk. Uh, and now I write comic books and I write articles online. And how I do that, I will also get to in a little bit. I'll pass this along. Hey everybody, good morning. Uh, I am Brent Black, AKA Brental Floss. Excuse my rough voice, uh, super fun night. Um, I, uh, I quit my job officially where like, or I quit doing big boy things and, and you know, finding a way to pay the bills that way in around um, April 2010. And uh, I do internet videos, most of the music videos, and I also play live shows and sell CDs. And uh, yeah, get more into that later. Hi everyone, I am Lewis Lovehog, also known as Linkara. I host the web series Top of Fourth Wall. Uh, I have been pretty much doing this for a living for about four or five years now, and it's been awesome. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lindsay. I do the Nostalgia Chick Show on Blip. Um, I, I hesitate to call uh, myself a professional anything, but I have been doing it for a living for, I guess, uh, well, I, it's hard to say because there's, there's, a, there's a gradient <laughs> when you're doing web series, but we'll just say four. Hi, um, my name is, uh, I go by Todd in the Shadows. I review music uh, in my own web series named after me. I guess, I don't know, I uh, didn't really quit, I didn't really quit my job as I, uh, as much as I just stopped looking for other jobs about, I, I would say about a year and a half, two years ago. I'm uh, Mike the Birdman Dodd. I do ThisWeekInGeek.net as well as I work with Blizzard Thumbs. Um, I've been doing this, I've been a radio professional for about five years with Clear Channel Communications, Astral Networks, and various networks across Canada and the US. And I've been doing this since I graduated college back in 2010. Just decided to make a jump at it in my career because working for anybody but yourself sucks. All right, so, so the structure of this panel is going to be the structure of most panels you've ever been to. We're going to talk for a bit, and then we're going to open up for q and I'm going to start with a general question for the panelists. Whether or not you quit something else, how did you know or what made you decide that you wanted to pursue a career in something that was, shall we say, not traditional? Well, I am not good at traditional work, uh, and I really like uh, to write, and I like writing about things that I love, and in this case, it's uh, genre, uh, television, film, radio, uh, and so I just started blogging, and I did it for free, and that led to being able to talk to other people in the industry, which led me to be able to do uh, short-form fiction work. And eventually, it led me to do what I do for the Science uh, uh, Fiction Network, which is that I write for their news site. Uh, and that's it, it really was just a matter of, I am not good at anything else, so I had better find a way to make this work. Uh, I think what attracted me to uh, non-traditional, um, I don't know, type of work and what I do is mostly my giant sucking need for attention. Um, that was a joke, wake up, I did it for you, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Get some coffee, come back, and I'll slap you on the bum. Let's make this happen. So, hi. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I can, I'm with Dan, I'm not good at, you know, doing normal stuff. I, I did catering, which was kind of like pretending you're a butler, basically. <laughs> it's kind of like putting on a show that you're, I don't know, some days you're Alfred, some days you're Benson, whatever. Um, <laughs> Benson, deep cut. All right. Um, but, uh... But you know, like, I, at some point, you find out, oh, there's a, 
there's this YouTube, eh? And you find out that there's a, there's a place where you could potentially get some validation for what you do, but not in that whole, hey, will you please read my book, Total Stranger, kind of way. Um, although sometimes it is. And you put something out there hoping, you know, somebody will pay attention and notice, and a lot of times they don't. And in my case, they didn't for a long time, but then they did. And it became almost like addictive, you know, like there's a place to go for this validation and attention. It's almost like a vending machine. And sometimes you push the button and it's like, dip, 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 and sometimes it's like, Pfft. but like, after a while, for me anyway, it was about attention and validation and, you know, I can't stop. Well, I will agree on the ego trip thing. Um, <laughs> now, in my case, I, uh, I've always tried to do something independent. Uh, since I was in high school, I tried to write books. I thought that would be my true calling. Uh, and I would be the guy who would go up to complete strangers and say, hey, read my book, read my book. Uh, it, that didn't work out, and in fact, the books aren't very good. As some people who have somehow managed to track them down and read them don't realize, I, I don't get why. But um, at the point where I decided to, uh, to completely go into this, uh, I was working at Barnes & Noble pretty much at the same time I was doing uh, just starting out in video production. I think I'd been doing so for, doing the videos for about a year or so, and I was, I, I loved working retail actually. I'm one of the few people who actually really enjoys interacting with customers and talking with them and helping them find stuff. Uh, but there came a point where I was starting to realize, you know, I could do so much more with my show and uh, if I was, you know, devoting 100% of my time to it and not worrying about trying to find books for other people. And, uh, and of course, when you actually watch the show, you realize yeah, nothing really changed, but, <laughs> but I was devoting more time to it and I was able to produce more content regularly and invest more work in a, in a review show that also had storylines. So it's, there just comes a point where you realize I, it's a matter of time management and I should invest more of my time in the thing that either is making me more money or I'm having more fun with. Um, I just really hate mornings, <laughs> as evidenced by perhaps my somewhat uh, slight malaise. <laughs> I, I also have a tendency to get fired um, from like normal people jobs. I was a waitress for a month after I started doing this and they, they fired me because your personality doesn't fit, like that sort of thing. And so I, I, I guess I'm kind of uh, unique because I, I didn't quit my job, I quit grad school to do this full time uh, because I, I was getting a film degree which you don't actually need to do. It's not like being a doctor, you know, you're like, oh, you need your certification to go be a PA on a set, like, no, you don't need that. So I, I, I quit uh, with 10 degrees left to go, or 10 credits left because I, I didn't want to pay another $20,000 for Stuff I already knew. So um, that, yeah, I, I, I it's, 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 it's a partially a, a, a need for being, your, having your own schedule and not having to deal with, uh, you know, a, an arbitrary demand for the thing. But also, um, I, I really just don't like mornings. And I don't, <laughs> Just a pro tip here before we get to Todd. Uh, if you do manage to get to a point where you're working for yourself and working freelance and working from home, expect your sleep schedule to go all over the place. <clears throat> Become nocturnal. Enjoy it. Embrace the night. <laughs> Thank you, Batman. <laughs> My story is, I, I want to say, fairly similar to Lewis's. I, I, was a, I was working as a substitute teacher and uh, eventually I decided to uh, devote my full time to this. Except uh, one major difference is that it wasn't like a spontaneous decision like his. It was more, I was slowly investing more time in doing my show than <coughs> doing real work. And um, it's actually a little more depressing. It was like, I kind of stopped working on things that would make me money, or at least that's how it would seem. I'm very lucky this uh, did work out for me because otherwise this would be a really, really s sad story about a guy who didn't do anything except his stupid little web show. And um, 
slowly I just stopped looking for a full-time position and this eventually started paying my bills because I, I enjoy it way more than uh, being in front of a bunch of horrible, horrible children. <laughs> well, that's hard to top. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, sorry, I kind of decided I wanted to work for myself coming out of uh, grad school in 2010 because well, look at the size of me. There aren't too many people that are going to give a chunk and dunk like me a chance. So rather than get screwed over saying you're not qualified, much like Lindsay, I tend to get fired a lot. I tend to use inappropriate language, if you know me personally. Um, and I just kind of wanted to do something. I wanted to be known for celebrating geek life, geek culture, geek lifestyle. And it's just through my podcast, This Week in Geek, I got picked up uh, and I get calls from people in various en entertainment industries saying, hey, what do you think? Is this authentic? Can you comment on this on the radio? Can you give us a quote for a newspaper? Stuff like that. And uh, well, that's, I, I guess that's kind of where I wanted to just stay. I, mean, I, I don't like working for anybody else. I don't play well with, with others, so to speak. And uh, yeah, I just didn't want to be somebody's corporate whore. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, we have one more person on this panel, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and talk about what you do. I'm Holly Christine, I'm one of the executives of Channel Awesome. Um, my story is a little strange because when Channel Awesome first started, I was friends with Rob and Doug, and I told them that they were fools, <laughs> and it was a really bad idea, um, and now I work with them, um, but yeah. Uh, getting used to working from home, I didn't quit my job. Um, I was working for a payroll company at the time. For it was terrifying, um, but it has been so rewarding because I get to do something creative. I get to do something that touches people rather than just making sure that, I mean, yeah, everybody likes to get their paycheck, but there's, there's no personal touch in that in stuffing an envelope, so. Thank you. Now, because this panel is called Going Pro, and it's not called, for example, How to Be Creative, I believe those are other panels on this MagFest. But we're going to focus for just a moment on the actual sort of money in, money out side of, of being a professional what's it. There are sort of three levels of people who do what we all do. First of all, there's the creative level, which I think many people, probably most of the people in this room, and probably most of the people in MAGFest are actually doing. We're making things, we're either making crafts, we're making videos, we're making music, we're making chiptunes, we're making everything, right? I mean, we can't stop making things. So that's sort of the first level. The second level is when you decide, for example, to, to start selling things. This is when the word professional begins to attach itself to you, whether you're selling crafts or music. And then the third level is you know, the one you all come to see. The point at which the money you're making from the selling of your things or the doing, however way we make the money, of course, eventually gets you to the point where you're asked to be on this side of the table. So, so my question to all of you panelists is, as, as, as much as you like to talk about it, we don't have to give any actual numbers, um, sort of how, how does the money come in? And particularly because we're freelancers and we have no guaranteed income, per se, how do you know when you have enough? Uh, oh, for us, it's mostly ad-based, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know, I think it's like, we, uh, the two of us are, are kind of lucky, or well, I'm saying lucky, but like, different, have a different perspective, because Blip tends to pay better uh, per view than YouTube uh, by a pretty good margin, but we have a flat rate, so our, our, we have a sort. We don't have to worry about the rates going up and down. So it really is just sort of like we've come to a point where we can relax about it and just know that if we get a certain amount of views, then we if we get above this threshold, and it's usually a pretty easy threshold to clear, then I will be able to pay my rent. Yeah, on my side of things, since I do not operate on a flat rate on Blip, uh, there are ups and downs to that. The up part of it is that when the revenue is really good, then Yay, very good, I don't have to put out as much content to make enough to live off of. When the rates really suck, then I have to work that much harder in order to uh, get enough to pay my rent every month. Uh, the, and again, it's, it's an ups and downs thing. 
for any freelancer, you gotta save your money. You got you gotta gotta store up for the winter. That's just like good common sense for well freelancers. There will be bad times. There will be good times. Plan for the future. Right. Uh, uh, speaking of the future, as a, as a freelance writer, for example, when I do work for NBC Universal, uh, I have to make sure that I keep my invoices. Uh, why? Because from the moment I submit an invoice, it is two and a half months before they pay it out. Uh, this is not uncommon with freelance writers. Uh, to the uh, addition of what you guys are talking about, if you're creating web content, a lot of what you're making money based off is ad revenue sales. So you have to think about not only how much content, but the kind of content that you put out. So for example, for the Brennan Foss comic, we did a thing in the month of December uh, uh, called, the, uh, <coughs> called The Obvious Troll. Hmm. It's early, and I've been up since five in the morning. Uh, the Obvious Troll, which was a great notion, a great idea, but which was a very large departure <laughs> from what we traditionally do, and as a result, uh, and December, so that you know, is a big revenue month, is when you make more money per ad. Uh, because it was less shareable, we didn't make as much in December as we normally would. So the lesson that we learned, and uh, a lesson that you should learn in general, is that during the month in which you are going to make the most money through ad revenue, you had better make the kind of stuff that is gonna get shared around and viewed a lot. And when you wanna experiment, you do it during the time in which you're going to make less money anyway. Uh, and I, I always like to think with with our stuff that uh, that we kind of follow uh, television trends with in terms of the ad revenue stuff because I've always found that the holiday season October through December is usually the best seasons for getting money. It's not always; there are always exceptions, but it's basically our sweeps month. So we'll always put out the best content, the stuff that everyone will want to rewatch or uh, uh, they'll share around and introduce more people to. Uh, for me, uh, because I deal more with uh, consultations and professionals, it's always constantly on the phone, on the phone. Um, as you, some people know, I don't sleep, which is a very good thing because I deal with people in Asia, I deal with people in England, and it's a lot of making phone calls. So for me, to keep my head above water, I always got to keep new clients coming in, new business coming in. And that's a lot of networking. I mean, one day I might be talking to a porn star, the next day I'm talking to a toy company, could be talking to a video game company or a movie guy. So it's a lot of, with me, it's a lot of who I know and just trying to get my name around. I mean, one of the fun things we joke around with at Twig is, it's six, it's six degrees of Mike Dodd, who do you know? Uh, marketing yourself is something that's extremely important. Oh yeah. And that's something that we worry about a lot. It's because for Channel Awesome, it's not just looking at ad revenue, but we also have the sales that we depend very heavily on. And when we feel like we're starting to get to a spot where the money's getting kind of tight, we're like, okay, let's put together a new product and get that out there and make those sales. Um, and you have to consider the amount of time it's going to take to make that product, for instance, um, a DVD. How long is that going to take uh, to put together, to get pressed, and to get to you, and then for you to ship that out? Uh, so what a, lot, a lot of what we're doing has been pre-sales or limiting the print of the DVD um, to help drive up its value. Oh, um, well, my business model, um, I'll, I'll test out explaining it to you because eventually I have to perfect explaining it to my parents, so. Uh, <laughs> so basically, uh, I do YouTube videos and that's kind of how I, I began on the internet. Um, and that is a certain amount of revenue, but in my case, my bread and butter is also music videos, which leads to CD production, slinging MP3s on iTunes, Spotify, Bandcamp, uh, Amazon MP3, and like a bunch of other things I've actually never used, like Deezer and like, you know, they all have cute little names and cool logos. Anyway, um, but the, the, the CD sales are actually what changed me from it being a cool hobby that occasionally brought in some cash to a job. And I think that, you know, the takeaway is sometimes the physical merch item, depending on what you do, you know, in my case, there's sort of a niche for you know, a, a, a specific kind of nerdy music that I guess I fill. Um, I guess the point is that once you are filling that void, having the confidence to, you know, realize that people may want to have a little piece of you that they can take away from the convention, that they can, 
you know, whether it's, uh, it doesn't have to be a plushie of you. But, you know, I, I think there's this, this notion, I mean, I've actually had this conversation with some of these people on this dais before. Um, different people's personalities reflect their openness about merch, especially merch when the brand is based on them. I'm happy to have somebody buy a plush of me. That sounds like the greatest thing ever. Some people are like, I would just feel like such a jerk. And, you know, I sort of see how that, you know, is, is a thing as well. I guess all I'm saying is, um, once, once you get to the point where someone likes what you're doing, and if it's an abstract thing like, you know, like music or, or, or uh, art, not art, but like visual art, um, giving them something physical, they, they, if they love you, they want it, and it's kind of how you stop making it a hobby and start making it a thing. So have the confidence to go, if they love me, maybe they love me 10 bucks, you know what I mean? Maybe they love me 15 bucks. Um, and that can actually, you know, be one of the things that takes you from an abstract, generous giver of art to someone who's actually getting back a little bit for their work. And I definitely agree with that. That's something that we consider a lot when we're pricing DVDs. Is this going to be too much that it's going to drive the fans away from it? Are they going to be upset that it costs this much for what they're getting? Um, so it is about how, how much do they love me in terms of dollars. Sell out. <laughs> but yeah, do the kiss model. Sell out. Merchandise everything is what I've discovered. Uh, because uh, you, it, would, it would help. I haven't sold much and I really should. Because I, I don't understand why someone would be bothered by selling plushie. I mean, you're not going, it's, it's not like you're going to really sell out. There's no major company looking for you, most likely. Says the guy who's yeah, based does, be on the plushie. To be devil's advocate, it can kind of bring the property value down if you were perceived as, like, that guy who is always hawking crap. You know, and especially, like, when this is... Yeah, I mean, this is an, indus an industry that is as small as ours. Everybody kind of knows each other. It's really easy to get that, you know, if you get that personality around. So I, that's why I'm kind of careful on the merch side. Brent and I have talked about this many times. <laughs> uh, I guys kind of giggle because I brought like 20 plushy cyber mats uh, with me here. Within like 20 minutes, they were all sold out. And it's not even, like, yeah, it got one right there. Uh, I want to merchandise more because I love, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to lie about it. I like getting supplementary income. I like making more money. Uh, the main purpose of coming here is to meet fans, to interact with them. But if people weren't watching the videos, weren't playing ads, I couldn't do this for, the, for a living because I couldn't afford it. Right, it gives you an opportunity to get an idea face-to-face, -face, not from some random stranger on a forum that you don't know you can trust, what in the last year worked and what didn't. Uh, and as far as merchandise is concerned, it becomes a balance of creating something that is going to make your fans happy, but also uh, coming up with things that hit a very broad base. People that might not know you might also get into things. We sold a t-shirt that was based off of uh, a Star Trek Next Generation character, Jean-Luc Picard, missing the Q train. And we sold it in New York because people know what it's like to miss the Q train. And they know who Picard is, so they thought that's funny and they bought it ad nauseum. They don't know who Brennan Floss is necessarily, but they like the shirt. So that becomes as much a factor. And it's also about timing. You don't want to oversaturate the market, especially if it's your face. You know, you don't want a t-shirt with your face on it and then another t-shirt. Yeah. Now it's a sad one. This, this Christmas, sorry, sorry, go uh, this Christmas I put out a Harvey Christmas, uh, sorry, Harvey Fine Voice Christmas album. Uh, unfortunately, it took a while to get it finished, so I will no, 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 the 22nd. Uh, and yeah, timing is a big issue with that because no one's gonna buy a Christmas album in January. So next year I'll have it you know, available and I can start promoting it right away, but I could have made a lot more money if it had been ready at the beginning of December as opposed to three days before Christmas. <laughs> one, one, one theme that I think I'm hearing basically is that, that, that uh, Okay, so no, knowing business stuff, having business acumen, as they say, um, helps regardless of what you're slinging. You know, if you're slinging, you know, videos about cats, business acumen's probably good. I think the thing is a lot of creative types, you know, like sometimes the business part of the mind is kind of logical and, uh, you know, the, the, I think the left side of the brain, I'm pretty sure, I don't remember. Um, but, you know, like math and things and numbers and how you do things. 
And then the actual creative side that's making stuff is like, whoa, this is great, I'm drawing stuff. Like, it's a completely different place. And finding a way to apply the creative stuff, either with yourself, either finding that business acumen or figuring out what works, just those tried and true business ideals and business, uh, you know, not formulas, but you know what I mean? Those kind of like rules, tips and tricks, rules of thumb, or getting somebody who does in your corner, you know, uh, is, can never hurt you if you're trying to make something that's fun and creative into a career. There is always a part of me that's trying to, I am more the creative type. I am not the biggest business savvy kind of person. I have to really fight myself to say, to say yes, do more business stuff, do because you have to you do the business thing. Because I, I always resist it. My parents are always bugging me. You know, you should do more to capitalize on this. I'm like, oh, I don't want to look like I'm just like all about the money. Like, no, you have to do this from a business perspective as well. You really do. Um, part of the reason that I was uh, eventually hired at Channel Awesome is because I had a corporate background. Um, and I managed budgets that were nationwide and international. So um, what it was is when I came into Channel Awesome, it was very heavy on the creative side, but it didn't have the administrative backup that it needed to um, pull all of that stuff together. A very quick run down the line. Um, what percentage of your time do you say you would spend doing businessy things to include emails, ordering product, communicating with vendors, packing product, communicating with clients, customers, shipping product, you know, <coughs> emails, etc. versus the actual creative content. For me, it's definitely 80% business administration, 20% content creation. Um, I'd say for me, it's about 95%, because obviously I have to go out there and meet people. Uh, because my show uh, takes, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, maybe an hour to record something. And editing takes me like five, ten minutes because it's all audio, so I'm really fast with it. But yeah, it's all doing emails, customer call, callbacks, and a lot of something a lot of people don't realize with this whole going professional. It's maintaining relationships. Like I, I, I don't do merch. It's just not my thing. I mean, if I were to sell body pillows, I hope you got two hundred dollars. I mean, awesome question. Huggable Todd. <laughs> um, but it's all about getting, like, for me, I do sponsorships. So I'm like, hey, I can offer you this value. What will you give me in return? And sometimes it's not always money. I take stuff that I need, which means if I need equipment, hey, I'm going to talk to Sony today. Or I'm going to talk to Ars Technica or whatever. And, and I find with me, by spending so much time on it, if I'm willing to call up some of these PR reps or salespeople, just say, hey, what's going on? And if, you, if you're really nice, and once again, it's a small world. People remember that. And a lot of people expect to get the sun and the moon for free. And on, I'm not going to lie, I kind of got into this because I like free stuff. Um, and who doesn't? Um, so if you are nice and you follow up emails, you follow up phone calls, these people are more likely to give you things. You are more likely to slip through the cracks if something really big is coming their way or if they've got more money to spend. They're more likely to remember you at the top of the uh, at the top of their list. Like, hey, that guy's all right. For me, the business side um, probably around zero percent. I, I let Lindsay handle most of that. I need to uh, <laughs> step it up. I'm I'm sure I'm uh, my revenue streams. I there are a lot that are uncapitalized on that I need to, um, but. Most of my stuff, I, I let Lindsay handle. She's better at it than I am. Uh, even then, I'm less than I should. <laughs> Maybe 10%. Like, now that we have our own site, a little more. But, like, I, I'm really bad about replying to emails. And, like, there's even... I, I guess, in a way, fan stuff is... I consider that in that umbrella, too. Because it's kind of like doing homework. Like, when people send you a letter, and it's like... Uh, okay. Because <laughs> you don't know what to say, and it's important. It's really important to maintain a, a, you know, a relationship with your base. You know, a distant one, but one that you know where they feel good about it. And um, I, I'm really, really bad <coughs> about responding to viewers and fans because I just never know what to say. And then there's you know like 
the other the other business side, like with the you know companies that you work with and colleagues and all that, and uh, it, it 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 kind of pot, it can pile up, and it's also really easy to ignore. So I will I will go with not as much as I should, but maybe ten percent. Well, in my case, I, I view the videos themselves as the product I'm delivering, so the creative side and the business side there do mesh together. And as such, I'd say, it, I, I always, I'm always asked how long it takes me to produce a video, and I really should actually time it at some point. Uh, I'd say usually around 20 to 30 hours minimum, because there's the writing process, which is probably the longest part of it. Uh, filming it only takes about an hour, unless I'm doing something much more extensive. And then editing it, I, if I really, really push myself, I could put out an entire episode in a day. But really, it's easy to burn yourself out if you're always trying to do every single thing within a single day, every week after week after week. Uh, as for interacting, and Lindsay is absolutely right. Yeah, the 90 minute episodes. <laughs> My episodes are really long sometimes, although in that case, yeah, there it is. A, now here's, the, now here's the thing about that. You're gonna talk, use the mic, because from out there it probably sounds like, yeah, I know. Uh, Lindsay, pointed out, Lindsay, out. Lindsay pointed out that, that I tend to produce a lot of episodes these days which are significantly longer. Uh, my 200th episode was an hour and 14 minutes long, which can be problematic, especially for people who come in with a YouTube mindset being, oh man, this is in five minutes, there's no way in hell I'm gonna watch this. Uh, now I take the attitude these days that if you're willing to sit down for a television show for 40 minutes or an hour and a half long movie, then yes, you can do that. But there is another side to it these days. Uh, more and more, we've had to incorporate mid-roll ads into our videos. Uh, it's We don't like doing it, but we have to in order to keep up the revenue stream. Now, I- You guys know what a mid-roll ad is? Yeah. Yes. Okay, just making sure. I thought you said mineral ad at first. I'm sorry, okay. it took me a second, all right. Have this wonderful mineral water. <laughs> no, uh, the, uh, the mid-roll ads, because they've, they've had to make you put in, I've taken the attitude of, you know what, I don't like it that it has to interrupt everything, so I will, put, I will, make, I will be more willing to let the episode run longer and, less, and cut less out of it, because that way they have 20 minutes of content, and then boom, they have, then they have the ad, and then they have another 20 minutes before the video ends, and that works uh, for that. There you go. What's the other thing else? Well, from the business side, I, my, my point is, and it has always been, and Lewis and I always butt heads on this, is it doesn't drive your, your core base down, it drives your potential base down. Um, to answer the, the question, I have about 80% stuff that I don't really want to do, and 20% stuff that I do want to do. Ironically, I still say, I do what I love. Um, <laughs> that's kind of, you know, like, and part of it is if you're kind of working by yourself, um, or even in a very small team, you and your brother, you and your girlfriend, you and your whatever, you know, best friend, you still only have so much manpower. And, you know, I took the path of, of trying to read and respond to all my emails. Big mistake. Um, because the second that you said that up as a precedent, it becomes, you know, it can be a, it can be a, a good thing PR-wise, but it can also suck away so much of your time, like a vacuum taking away your life. Um, but it can also bring you huge opportunities and you know, it's always good if you have people to know who you are. Interacting with them and choosing to interact with people who give a crap about what you're doing is never a bad choice, although sometimes it is a, a huge time suck. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm about 80-20. I have about a thousand emails sitting in my inbox right now, literally a thousand emails from fans because I used to set the precedent of uh, answering every single one of them and I thought it was important it eventually comes to a point where you just don't have enough time. Right. Uh, Lewis, you had said something that rang very true for me regarding this question, which is that uh, the business end and the creative end had to mesh in a lot of times. So when I write for uh, the Sci-Fi Channel, uh, I have to do a lot of research, and then I have to pitch things to my editor. All of these things are business related, and then it's a waiting game until he says yes about things. And then the creative element from there is, because it's an article most of the time, I've got to bang that thing out within an hour. So it's like research, research, research for however long and wait. And then right, 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 as quickly as you can. And then you get to do it all over again. Uh, and then as far as uh, the comic that Brendan and I do together, um, again, those things mesh because it's like, even if we're doing something creative, I'll call Brendan up on the phone and say, I had this idea. 
and I'll say this is what it is, and you know, this is a comic, it's supposed to be funny, in theory. Um, and you know, and I'll say, here's the idea, and Brent will go, I like it, it's funny. You know, we're, like, when we get together, there's an opportunity to be like, ha, 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 ha. but most of the time it's like, here's the idea, yeah, I like it, great, that is hilarious, please draft it up, you know? Is that, cre is that creative? Is that business? It's a little bit of both in that way. You know what I mean? Um, so I would say, yeah, 80 20 is also sort of where I land. I would say I'm 97 to 98% administration and 2 to 3% creative. Uh, the guys do come to me when they have ideas about what's going on with the show, and I do line production on the anniversaries and I'm gonna start directing and producing some game shows. But um, yeah, most of my time, even though I have one week out of the year that is insane with working on the creative aspect, the entire rest of my year is pretty much based on administration. But it, it does have to mesh, even if it's not you as one person doing it. When you're doing it as a team, you still end up doing that because Everybody sort of, sort of needs to know where the company's going and what you're doing with your brand because it's uh, it's the best way to be able to market yourself is if everybody with Twitter and Facebook pages and all of that if everybody in a company or in a group is able to go out and tell their friends it starts to go by word of mouth, and so if everybody knows the, some of the creative portion, it really is helpful, even if you are mainly administrative-based. All right, I am curious, this is, this is where I show how, how um, staggeringly well prepared I am. Are we until 11.30 or are we until noon? Because the, my guidebook says we're until noon. <coughs> we are until noon, good, because I, because I want to ask one more question and then I want to turn it over to you all for questions. All right, so this is why I'm asking this question. Currently, I live in a, in a house with like six other women, right? It's one of those deals where one woman sleeps on the couch and one woman sleeps on the other couch and one woman sleeps in the laundry room which got converted into a bedroom, that kind of thing. And when I started, when I made the quitting part of my life, I realized, I mean, I was afraid of this. I was afraid that I was going to be living in a group house with six other women and one of them would be living in a laundry room. And, and then I realized <laughs> that is how I had been living my entire life, even when I had real jobs. So, so part of that, and then of course thinking about the health insurance thing, right? Well, it's, it's like, I'm afraid if I quit my job, I'm going to have terrible health insurance. Wait a minute, I already kind of do, right? <laughs> Um, so there's this, this sensation, particularly in the last 20 years, that most of the, the fear barriers to doing something you love have been removed, right? I'm afraid of not having a steady income. Well, that's gone out the window, right? I'm afraid of having a terrible living room, you know. And so I'm curious if anyone wants to speak to their living situations, health insurance, tax situations, anything like that. We're talking, we talked about money coming in. Let's talk about money going out the door. And then we'll open it up to questions. I, I, I think the going out the window thing is, uh, I'm going to disagree. Are you insured? You're insured. Just barely. We're, you, well, you're insured. We're not insured. That, and then basically we are kind of holding our breath till 2014 for the new health care law to kick in. And, just, and it is just kind of banking on that because uh, health insurance in New York State is just... It's obscene for even like the HMO stuff. It's just not worth it. Yeah. So, um, uh, and that is a big risk. That is a gamble. I've been chronically ill for the last eight years. And so quitting my job and being able to have access to health insurance was very, very important to me. So it was terrifying to think about quitting my job and joining up with a company that at any time could go under. Um, I have found the, the benefits um, personally out, outweigh that risk, um, but we as a company do offer health insurance to all of the people who are on our payroll. So, um, and that's something that's very important to us because we are a family and, 
everybody is very valuable and we need to make sure that everybody is healthy and able to do their job because if one person is down, it affects everything. I am going to bring up unions and try and keep this as apolitical as possible. If you do not like unions, forgive me. Uh, my wife uh, is a union worker and as a result she works a certain number of hours, makes a certain amount of money, and as a result I am allowed to have health insurance with her. Uh, freelancers often have a freelance union through which you can get health insurance if you make a certain amount of money. Uh, Yes. It's, it's, it's something. It is something. It is, it, is something. A, it is a thing that exists. Alternatively, when I was working a regular day job, uh, I was doing single payer health insurance. Uh, I don't know where everybody else lies in the room. I have an ongoing condition. I am a permanent sick person. I cannot have health, I cannot go without health insurance. If I do not have it, I will be dead. So prior to having this other option uh, through a union, I was paying almost $900 a month which for many of you is probably more than you pay for rent. Uh, and so it was prohibitively expensive. Um, as far as uh, ex expenses otherwise, uh, I was just talking about, you know, I was just mentioning that people sometimes are concerned that if they become a creative freelancer, what's it? They're going to be living in squalid circumstances. And right, but, the, but the, the economy is terrible anyway, exactly. which I think is was sort of your point from the start. And when I was working as a comic book clerk, uh, I was living with my wife and our roommate. And now that I am a professional, I am living with my wife. And we no longer have a roommate, and it's great. I feel bad being the only Canadian on this panel. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rub that in. <laughs> Dot. Isn't it awesome? Um, but no, like, uh, I got fairly fortunate with me. I mean, um, when I went to college, actually, there were certain drugs that weren't covered for me uh, because I'm diabetic and that sucks. Um, but some of the expenses going out, because I recently discovered my knees are destroyed. If you've seen me trying to struggle getting around this convention center, I'm a little worried this may not be covered by Ontario Health Insurance called OHIP, and I really don't want, don't want to be that fat guy in a wheelchair, so I'm really worried what the doctor's going to say, so I know that may be an expense coming out of me and my wife's pocket. Fortunately, my wife is a teacher. That was brilliant, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, uh, expenses for us, it's a lot of travel which means I'm in Toronto a lot, and I live about an hour outside the city, and these meetings may only last 15, 20 minutes. And parking in Toronto, for those, uh, are there any Canadians here? Is it a curiosity? Okay, so you know parking in Toronto sucks, and that can add up. Like, you thought New York City is expensive, surprisingly Toronto is more, which is really, really weird. Um, but I don't know, that's just what I've heard. Uh, but it, it, it like adds up for us. So it's a lot of business expenses for us. Uh, so car, gas, even computer uh, equipment, because I'm fine I'm going through uh, things quicker than what I used to. So those are my out-of-pocket expenses. Um, oh, for me? All right, um, on the lighter side, um, writing off stuff, it's really important. I didn't know how important it was for a long time. Because I was afraid of this, like, you know, ghost of Christmas future tax man that was going to show up and be like, What have you been doing? You've been doing it all wrong. No, no. My gravestone of the future, it says he was poor and didn't do his taxes very well. Ah. Um, can I change it, spirit? Can I change it? Um, and it turns out, yes. Um, I got a tax guy for the first time, actually. Um, you know, I actually made money. I, I made money and, you know, survived as a human being before 2012, but it was the first year that I got a tax guy. Um, and he gave me a spreadsheet that has all the stuff you can write off if you make money from, you know, creative things, making things, uh, and selling them. Um, really, even if you just promote yourself, like I don't know the actual legal uh, the intricacies, but basically, you're making things, you're trying to get them out there. I think if one person pays a dollar for them, now you have a situation where if you put you know, capital into that, and I mean capital like I was working you know, out of town on this project and I bought a Mr. Good bar. Well, bam, that's it, you know, like that receipt. At some point, if you are spending time and money and going to places or getting supplies to make things or that kind of thing, gas that you really did use to get back and forth from a place where you made a thing, these things all become kind of um, 
you know, parts of you making the thing you make and therefore things you can write off. And so, you know, it changed my life just looking at a list that included like um, pet, something like pet care while on tour or you know what I mean? Like out of pocket medical while on tour, which is a different category. And I was like, okay, I can, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do video game stuff. So I bought a Wii U and wrote it off. And you know, it's not like, hey, fun times, I can buy toys, but you know, like, it kind of is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I guess the, the, the takeaway here is that um, once you get to the point where you're somewhere between wanting to, to do this and, and not, well, or, or succeeding and on some level in, in making something that people want and even selling it, at that point, it's, I just can't advise enough, I can't urge you enough to look into getting someone who knows what they're talking about just to tell you what you can write off because you might not realize how much you could be keeping instead of giving to the government. Yeah, both, both my parents worked for the IRS. You have tremendous latitude in, in what you can write off. If you think there's even like a remote possibility you could write it off, write it off. Receipts, receipts, receipts. Hold on to them. Grab as many as you can. Put them in a nice little folder that you're not gonna lose. Yeah, receipts right. are super important. When I started with Channel Awesome, uh, they had just finished filming kick -Ass yet, and I was working on getting the books in order, and there were almost no receipts from Reno. And it was sort of terrifying, because it's like, okay, well, now we have to go in and um, contact the stores, or if you don't have a receipt, and it was paid in cash, and all of that stuff, it, it becomes much more difficult to track it down. So you have to hang on that, to that from the beginning. Um, and it's also really important to know the value of what you have because, for instance, if you're owning office furniture, that's, that's tax depreciable. So you need to know that because all of that becomes really important. So if you don't know the tax stuff and you can't afford an accountant, research that because it's so, so important. We had to go back and redo the first uh, three years of the books of Channel Awesome um, once we started to dig into that and find out that some of the stuff that was on there, we were like, well, okay, what's this expense for $300? Uh, well, it, it, was a, it was a chair. Okay, well, what kind of chair? What did you use it for? Where, did, where is it now? Um, that's, that's all really important to know. To, to, I guess, go back to the squalor and, li and lifestyle discussion, I find that some people just, their personality is not cut out for it because a lot of people need security. And they need the security of a nine to five, whether they like it or not. They, I mean, it's just sort of like a cost benefit analysis of is it worth it to not have that security and to not have that insurance versus uh, do the thing where I would have more creative freedom and be my own boss and sleep until noon and get fat and it's fine because I'm, you know, inside all day, or um, just to have the security. And uh, I, I know a lot of people that are just like, no, it's not worth it. I mean, I would like to do it, but I need that security. And that's okay, but that is just, that is a personality thing. Creative squalor is the best kind of squalor, though, <laughs> to be fair. I, I was very fortunate when I finally moved out of my parents' place, and let me just assure you creative types, Unless your parents have a problem with it, you should not have any shame living with your parents. Uh, <laughs> I was very fortunate because uh, I was dating a wonderful woman at the time when we've now broken up, but we moved in together and it was, it was hard when she moved out and I had to pay the entire rent of the apartment. It was, it's good for me though, because it's good for me to live on my own and have to worry about these kind of bills. But just to, once again, to build on everything, right off everything. I write off part of my rent because it's a space that I am filming in. Part of that space is my office. If you're driving to a place to buy something, write off the gas, do the math, it is worth it. Every penny counts. Thank you. All right, let's open it up to questions from the audience. Sir in the purple with the red lanyard. That's you. I'll just call you out my color clothes. Um, so apart from just being able to make a good product, can you already kind of touched on this a bit, but apart from being able to make a good product, is there a particular reason that stands out for you why someone should not put their data out there? 
All right, I'll repeat the question for everyone. Besides the inability to make something worth selling, what are other reasons why people should not quit their day jobs? Um, here's the thing. Even if it's worth selling, that doesn't mean people are going to buy it. Like, being good is no guarantee of being successful. And that's just a huge part of it. Yeah. Um, matter of fact, I, you really have to believe in yourself. You really have to believe that you are going to succeed and that nothing is going to stop you from making what you make. Like, you want to do this because you want to do this and no one's going to discourage you. So, let me try and discourage you. You suck. You're not going to succeed. And, um... <laughs> and if, if you, like... It's, this doesn't work for most people. Right, well, it's sort of like being a, a stand-up comic. You know, they say if you're a stand-up comic, when you start, you're pretty much going to bomb constantly, but you always have to believe that you're killing it. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, if you hear that and you still want to do this, then you should do it. But bear in mind, it is really, really hard to do this for a living. For the, uh, for the video producer's side of, of this, uh, we work in a very uncertain field, and we just managed to, we were very lucky. We managed to grab the zeitgeist and have grabbed an audience uh, at the right time. And there are still a lot of people out there who are very good, but haven't gotten the numbers that we're at that we can live off of it. Uh, it's a combination of luck, talent, and drive and determination to keep on doing it. And unfortunately, a lot of you will fail. And I'm very sorry to say that, but it's true. And sometimes you'll fail on the way to succeeding. You know, try again, fail better, they say. Um, saying go back in, I think. Twirl my little mustache. Um, um, so, yeah. Uh, Oh, I had a great point, and I lost it because I, I said mustache. It's my rude phrase, but I'm going to keep talking anyway. Um, no, the, the question was about uh, how you know you're ready, or, or what would keep you rather from, from quitting your day job, what should keep you. And um, you just have to really, really, really be honest with yourself. Because if you're deluded, if you're the kind of, you know, have you ever seen that kid that like never gets the lead role in the show, but every, every show they do is the tree. Their parents like, you are the best one, and somehow they buy into that for 20 years. And then go to school for acting, and then don't, you know, make it. Why? Because they, for some reason, were not honest with themselves, or somehow they, you know what I mean? And you have to be, some people are always their, you know, their, their own worst critic, and that can, that can cripple them and make it where they're, they're not confident about putting anything out there. Um, so it's kind of like you have to find yourself where you are and go, when I'm really honest with myself, am I naturally super insecure and therefore need to build myself up and puff up my confidence, blowfish style, or am I a huge egomaniac and I need to really make sure that I'm good before I go out there and I'm not just listening to the Kool-Aid my parents are feeding me because they love me, you know? Um, the takeaway is honesty, and, you know, not necessarily being really mean to your work and to what you do, but just, you know, looking in the mirror and really, you know, cutting all the BS. Uh, one thing I would like to add to that is uh, have a solid plan B. If things fall to shit, be ready for it. I mean, when I first started out, my, my fiance now wife was really supportive. She still supports me when the months suck. And a support system, I mean, I'm not saying someone to hold your hand and say, you know what, it's, it's going to get better, but someone who can hold you up. And another thing um, to, to kind of discourage people is you can't just do flash in the pan things. Like, you can't make a career off of making fun of Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey because it's cool now. That's not going to be true in three months. Right. So you have to be cognizant of what's going on. Like, I, like uh, all of us went to a thing called Comp Bravo last summer. And we heard so many people say, oh, I want to be an online reviewer. And that terrifies me. Yeah. Because, like, guys, this, we all got lucky. And I sort of came in through the back door. Like, I, like, the, the, the success all of you have is amazing. People know your faces. People know my voice. And that's about it. And, but it's just, it terrifies me that people think this is an easy way to make money. Don't go to school. Don't work retail and work in a coffee shop. No, for the love of God. Stay, have some money. No, I get, like, I'll get emails that are like, you inspired me to do what you do. I'm like, oh, God. See, they, these are the ones where you don't know what to say. You know, it's like, <laughs> you just want to be like, don't. Pro tip, the word thanks is always a good start. 
as long as we're talking about how to, you know, like just just kind of, it's not it's not always a mystery. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're if you're confused about somebody who likes your stuff, be vague and also specific. Like be like, thanks, you really wrote me a thing there. Thanks. <laughs> and then you know, I mean, it's better than nothing's all the same. And, and again, the, I, I bring up uh, again the drive thing. You really have to enjoy what you're doing to keep on doing it. Like, like I said, I started out at Barnes and Noble. I still love doing that. And but the hell's going on over there? Anyway, there's a convention out there. What? Oh, kind of. It's oh, sorry, a festival. Uh, then I'll just leave it over to. Uh, in addition to uh, what everybody else has said, if the phrase "change is bad" is familiar to you either change or don't do this. Uh, because the thing is, you're going to have to be able to turn on a dime with things. You may be really successful at something, as these people will tell you, uh, at any point in time, uh, the thing where everybody knows them in a convention could be over, and they had better be able to then figure out what is next. And you also had better be able to be predictive. What is the thing that is going to be successful next, you hope? but you have to be willing to do the research and take the time. And we were talking a lot about this idea of people waking up at noon. Well, if you wake up at noon, you would better be up all night working. Uh, because just because you're not working a nine to five, although well, the nine to fives don't really exist anymore, uh, the fact of the matter is you would still better end up planning on working a 10 hour day because there's a lot of shit to do. Uh, and if your answer is, well, I want to be able to sleep in and be lazy, don't do this. You cannot be lazy and do this. That's true, you can't be lazy. For instance, Doug still wakes up very early in the morning and does all of his um, really intense stuff right away, straight away in the day while it's light out um, because that helps give him energy. Um, I do agree, you have to be ready to, to jump in. Uh, there will always be some sort of doubt in your mind, but you have to be able to weigh the pros and the cons and say, yes, this is what I'm doing. Because when I graduated from college, I had majored in theater, and I was not ready for a creative job. I was scared that it's not steady work, I can't always depend on a paycheck, and I wasn't prepared for that. So it took a long time for me to be able to jump in and do this. Um, but you have to know the administrative side, you have to be able to do that, you can't be somebody who like, well, it'll figure itself out. People get in a lot of tax problems for just being like, well, uh, it'll work out. So um, you either need somebody who can help you with that or do that for you, or you need to be able to know it yourself. Um, and having a support system is also super, super important, as Mike said. Um, actually, just just kind of thinking about that. Is it worth mentioning, because you, we all talk about working really long hours and everything, there's also potential health problems. And, I, and that, like, I became an insomniac because of all the hours I was putting into college and putting into all the shows that I produce. I, like right now, I'm working on a 25 hour day. This is not healthy, and that's something to take notice too, because you're gonna stress yourself out over this job. And like Lewis said, you can burn yourself out. And it, there's no shame in looking for help, like talking to someone. Like, keep in contact with your physician. Working a creative or high-stress business, it can hurt. And I don't like to admit this, but yeah, there are nights I broke down crying. because It's hard. This is one of the hardest things you'll do if you really want to pursue it. Be ready to bring your A-game every single day. I lead a very sedentary lifestyle, and I love fast food, and if you watch my very first videos compared to where I am today, I make jokes about this, but I've put on 40, 50 pounds because I'm not active as much as I should be. Yeah, you definitely can't be lazy and sit around and just wake up at noon. Like, if you're waking up at noon, you are working all night, you can't plan on having a fantastic nightlife with all of your friends who work nine to fives. It's just it's really not possible and you have to be able to say what I'm doing creatively is worth giving that up. All right, um, <laughs> next question. Now I saw the woman with the necklace and the choker. You've been raising your hand during this whole time. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> okay, which question? Um, Throw it out. Okay. Um, I guess my 
question I'd like to ask is, how much does, um, I'll ask all three, you guys pick, because I think that I'm probably not the only one with them. Type of media, you're a creative person, you dip into lots of different things, you don't always know what form it's going to take. Some of us don't sit there and think, you know, oh, look, I want to do a blog. Some of us just, you know, have something and we need to put it out there and get some kind of outlet. And we know maybe down the road we'd like to be freelance, but not sure what, you know, is it music, is it writing, is it blog, is it fiction? You know, just a thought. My second question, how much does the potential poverty or stress affect your output, your ability to, is it worth it, or how do you balance that need to make money to feel some security just so that you can sit down and, and, and be creative. And then my last question is about collaboration. Um, you, not everybody does everything, I guess. Sometimes it's better to collaborate. And you guys seem to be lucky to work with like-minded people, which is wonderful. So how does that happen? Sure. I'm going to rephrase all three of the questions for everyone who might not have heard them. The first question is, how do you balance your health with the ability to create, or how does your health and stress level affect the ability to create? The second question, which is one I think we've already touched on a bit, is how do you, you know, living in squalor versus living in whatever, right? How, do, how does that fear affect your ability to create? The third and final question is about collaboration. I'll let anyone answer any question they want. All right. First one about medium. Medium. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. First one was, um, you are good at many things. How do you pick which medium to focus on? I'm going to answer that first one just real quick here. If you feel you have something to say about a particular medium or a particular uh, uh, thing out there, just put it out there. I started out just writing text reviews, not making any money on it, but I thought I had something to say. So just do it. Definitely experiment. If, if you're not sure what kind of media medium you want to use, experiment because that is the best way for you to find out because for instance Lewis used to write that was that was how he got started and he figured out that that wasn't exactly what he wanted to do and what was best for him obviously writing is still a very big part of what he does and a very important part of what he does but he experimented to help figure that out video pays better <laughs> video video does pay better per click what? Yeah, I agree. That's for sure. <laughs> There's a reason I don't do video. Um, the one thing that I really wanted to ask, answer was the second question, how it's really going to affect you. Um, and I'm actually going to get intensely personal here. Um, my output on my show with you today has slowed down significantly. Um, I was diagnosed bipolar to two last year, and it has really, really affected me. Like, so much so, like I said, I'll spend nights crying. I was suicidal up until about a month ago. And it's because I was so stressed out, so burned out every day, trying to figure this out, trying to be creative and everything. And it, it's hard, because trying to share a piece of yourself really gets hard every day, because that's the thing. You're trying to put out constant content. Like, Lewis, you put out a few videos a month or whatever. You have time. I literally fire from the hip, and that's just how it goes. So you really have to be, like Brent said, realistic with yourself what you can handle, because like I just said a few minutes ago, this gets really, really tough. You have to put yourself first, yes. no matter what. You have to put your health first, because if your health gets to the point where you can't produce, then you're, you're no good to anybody. You, you have no money. So whatever it is, put your health first. Um, I have fibromyalgia and a mystery autoimmune disease that doctors have been researching for the last eight years. So quitting my job, was terrifying, um, but it has been a very real balancing act for me. What time is best for me to wake up and work and um, be able to do all of the administrative and creative stuff? What times are work best for me? Um, it's all about figuring that out. Now, sometimes um, worrying about the, your poverty level and whatnot is is sort of a drive because then you will produce more but if you let it get to the point where it's just weighing you down it's you're going to get to the point where you're not producing good enough content that will draw people in or it, it will definitely affect your work well, burnout so, burnout is a thing like it is a big thing um i, I kind of wanted to 
offer a dissenting opinion because I don't want people to think that the, what we do is that hard. It's really not. Yeah, both coal miners have a tough too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's really not that hard. Um, part of the reason I do this instead of a nine to five is because I find it less stressful. But it, it, is in, it is often, in a lot of ways, stressful, just in a different way. Um, I guess audience expectation, because like a couple months ago, I just got burned out, I felt like, because I, I get burned out a lot easier than like Lewis, who just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes, and Doug, who I'm pretty sure is a pod person. <laughs> I, I think he is. <laughs> yeah. He just, he gets up at five in the morning like, sun has cracked, let's go. And then he's like, we're Doug, like, I want to die. 16, 18 hour days on set, and Doug is just going the whole time, and the rest of us are dying. Yeah. We're slumped awesome. in our chairs, people are sleeping on each other in between takes, and yeah. So I, like, I live in New York. My cost of living is probably much higher than any of you. Um, but I, I've gotten to a point where I, I, I don't really worry about it all that much because, uh, like, and I, I kind of, in a way, I have that luxury where if I do get burned out, I can seek, because, uh, you know, I did go to film school, so I can do freelance work elsewhere when I do get sick of this, which I do sometimes because eventually you're just like, I don't have anything to say about anything. And then you go into the ground and hibernate and, you know, make. <laughs> The claws <laughs> become a grizzly bear. It's very make, cool to watch. We have a thing. Um, we're trying to make that be girl. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> next mag fest. Trying to make girl happen. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I, I guess it, it, burnout is a thing, but I, I don't want people to think that what we do is like, oh god. And then I had to sell my cat. Well, okay, but uh, flip side, flip side, if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, and with that said, what to do? What media? I get lots of questions from lots of children. I don't know why they think I'm a good resource. I'm not, in general. But because of years of like, you know, younger years being like, I have this thing in my heart, I need to express it, but how? And, you know, my first gut reaction is always like, well, if you don't know, then, I mean, you know, I can't help you. But the more I've heard that question, the more I've had to think about what if it was, what if I had a kid and they asked me that? What if I had a student and they asked me that? So here's the, the piece of advice I am most excited to share with you today. If it doesn't ring true to you or apply to you, forget I was ever here. Um, but here's how I look at trying to make something, particularly on the internet or just artistic in the world, that you might ever want to sell. I feel like everyone, Every individual is like a kitchen that is incomplete. You have certain kinds of spices and flavoring, certain things in the fridge, certain kinds of utensils and pots and pans, but not everything. So if you only have like savory spices, you should not try to make a sweet pie. You will not. I cannot be Freddie Mercury. Try though I might. I will never be him. I have a different kitchen. I have a different set of ingredients, but the exciting thing is that it's, you know, everyone being unique, you know, they say, oh, you know, you're like everybody else, unique. But seriously, everyone having their unique uh, set of talents, skills, things they know, things they've honed, means that there's something you can make that nobody else can make. And I feel like the more I see people go from being nobody to being somebody because they wanted it bad enough, it seems to me that most of the time it's them figuring out whatever it is that they can do that nobody else can. <coughs> Um, you know, you can't reinvent the wheel, but you can make a wheel the way you make a wheel. Um, and it's just really important to figure out that intersection between not, not trying to imitate somebody else and trying to be somebody else. Like Lindsay said, you know, lots of people will, will be like, oh, I want to be just like you. And, and like even into adulthood, they'll try to mimic something or someone they really want to be like. Like if you read the Stephen King book and you follow everything he says about writing, you'll be another Stephen King. At some point, you have to take what, you know what I mean? You have to synthesize your own thing. But whatever you can make in that little metaphorical kitchen here I'm trying to paint for you in your mind, that nobody else can make is the most important, I think, contribution that you have because it's something that only you can do. Brent. Yes. Can we talk about collaborating together? I refuse. No. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Uh, sure, sure. <clears throat> so much for collaboration. Oh, man. Uh, I don't so, know, it's too early. So Brent and I collaborate on a comic together. And uh, we've talked about a lot of things, and one of the things, burnout, uh, there are times in which I'm like, I just do not have it in me 
to make people laugh today. <laughs> I can't do it. And then I'll say to Brett, I just don't, man, I don't got it. And then you'll come up with something. Yeah. And then we'll have a comment. Yeah. We put it out twice a week. And the fact of the matter is if you have a schedule, and ours does, Tuesday, Thursday, every <coughs> week, twice a week, a comic has to come out. And if you uh, are a content provider, it is very important that you set a schedule and you keep to the schedule as best as you can. When you stop doing that, your, your audience will stop reading or viewing or yeah. watching what you do. It's so oversaturated. They have so much other stuff to look at, not just cats and farting babies, but also other content. But it's gonna be a lot like yours because there's so many people making content on the internet now. But if they know for a fact that every certain number of days a week, there will be that thing from you, they will bookmark it, or however they do it, RSS feed, what have you. Muscle memory even sometimes. They will, they will come back to you. Uh, and the beauty of having a collaborator in this case is that at the time in which you just can't do it that day, you will have somebody else to pick you up and carry you. And sometimes it'll switch and then you'll carry them. Uh, and during the perfect times, you'll work together and yes. then you'll create a thing where like you were talking about the kitchen, yeah. you have certain spices, you have certain things, I have certain things, we are not the same. Right. And as a result, when we create something and it's all perfect and we're both firing on full cylinders, we get something that is wholly different, that is more than the sum of each other's parts. Right, exactly. It's not dirty for a second. <laughs> we you know what I meant. It's more than just my human and yes, yes. your but, but, acumen. But, the, but my point is, uh, when done correctly, collaborating is, uh, I think it can be essential. Yeah. I mean, you have to be able to do things on your own as well, but having somebody to collaborate with is unbelievably beneficial because you will constantly be learning from each other. We've spent a lot of time at this panel talking about just how hard it is, how difficult it is, and, and I just don't want us to come across like we're trying to discourage people from trying to do this. It is ultimate, a lot of this is ultimately rewarding. And, yeah, don't, 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 don't come out of it as thinking, oh my god, this is the most horrible thing in the world, I can't believe we, we, I ever wanted to do that, no. But, if, but you didn't need to know the realistic side yeah. about how much is the fun, like, exciting, creative part, and how much is the boring, administrative, keeping track of numbers and receipts, all of that part. Um, but I think... Um, Dan made a very good point about collaboration. It's super important to not limit yourself to the kind of media that you usually use. Um, it's so important to um, branch out into other areas because, for instance, if you're a writer but don't know anything about video and, and there's somebody who does video stuff and is a great editor but is not so good at writing, you can collaborate together and come up with something that is entirely different than what either of you may have usually done. Very nice. All right, let's take next question. Sir, in the black jacket. Um, what's an effective way of like beginning to market yourself and getting people to look at you over the 500 other people doing exactly what you do? Fantastic. This is a signal v. noise question. How do you market yourself? How do you jump out past the 500,000 other people who are also doing what you do? One, don't do what other people are doing. Right. <laughs> but also, you know, having or faking confidence. If you are hesitant to promote yourself, you're going to have to be that much more important and organically big. I'm not saying you need to, like, find, you know, somebody to, like, you know, have you heard, I read this article the other day about people that like bump up their numbers on Facebook. They'll have 100,000 fans, but no one's commenting on anything, like somehow. Like that's not what I'm talking about. But um, I think it's important to not be afraid to say, hey, I have this thing. If you felt it in here and you want to share it, don't be afraid to, you know, like, I don't think Facebook ads work. But for example, to do a promoted post or, you know, some kind of little thing that nobody will notice on the side there. Um, but unconventional means of promoting yourself. Uh, have great risks, great rewards. You know, like, ultimately, marketing, I think, is just as much about persistence as it is about, uh, as it is about finding the right way to market. Um, but also, if your content's not good, it doesn't matter how you package it, it's still a turd. So, you know, like, fundamental, make what you're doing good. Make it something as fresh and unique as possible, or at least something that fills 
uh, a need, find the intersection between what people would actually want. This is if you want to make a career and not just a hobby. But the intersection between what people want and what you want to do. Persistence in marketing is key. You can't just say, yeah, I have the Facebook page. You have to be involved in that Facebook page. You have to keep driving the interest in whatever you're pointing people towards. So you can't just say, well, I have this thing and expect that it will just go from there. You need to have relationships and be able to talk with people uh, and communicate with people about what it is that you want them to look at and see. Uh, two things. Uh, one, the internet is a wonderful resource. It has many, oh, I'm sorry, Lindsay. I have to go, because okay. we have to check out. <laughs> but um, uh, work hard, play hard, uh, peace out. <laughs> so if you're trying to market yourself, uh, the good news is there are these things. Uh, Twitter, Reddit, Tumblr is a great resource. All of these things mean so like if we put out a comic, I don't just say, comic's done, well, I'm sure people will find it. <laughs> I then will go and promote it on Twitter and give it a hashtag, and I will go on Tumblr and I will put part of it up, or however I end up ultimately using, choosing it, and I will put a million fucking tags on it connected to anything that that particular strip might that those people, those communities might be interested in. It's the same thing with Reddit. There are a million resources, forums. All of those things you have to be willing to utilize, but you need to, depending on the content that you're creating on that occasion, realize which ones are worth spending the time on and which ones are not. That being said, the internet is great. There is also a world that is not the internet. Uh, when I first started, uh, I, um, I was a blogger talking about Joss Whedon really material, and a million people were doing that. How did I separate myself from the pack? I started getting in touch with and going to cons with the people that created the product. In this case, by then it was the comics. And as a result of getting to know those people, I got to do what I wanted to do, which was, I, I wrote an Angel comic for IDW at one point. Uh, I did the same thing. I was a big Doctor Who fan. I went to Doctor Who cons. I met the creators. I got to write a Doctor Who short story. I was commissioned by the BBC to do so. Why? Because I met some fucking people. You have to eventually leave your house. You cannot be a freelancer and just stay in all day and just make the product. You also have to leave. These cons are incredibly important. They are a resource. I came here. I did these panels. Randomly, unexpectedly, and this will happen to you, I went to a lunch, and I started having a conversation that I've had with my wife and my friends many times, and suddenly there was a person there that had information and a skill that made me go, oh, this could be real now, and then I made that connection. You trade your information, so you have to also be willing to leave your safety zone, which is often home and internet, and go out and come to cons and go to places in order to meet people. Also, uh, when I was... Expanding what I said earlier, content. You know, e even all the greatest promotion in the world won't help if your content is the same as anything I can get anywhere else. Like, oh, you made a Final Fantasy sprite webcomic. I, there are many of them. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you're a guy talking into your camera on YouTube. There are many of them. You have to do something to stick out from the rest of it. Figure out what makes you special. Figure out what people like about you that they don't like about, that they can't get from someone else. I know That's a lot very of, important. I know a lot of people who are writers who are afraid to show their work to other people, but yet they keep wanting to produce content and they want it to go somewhere. Don't be afraid to show your friends and your family your work and have <coughs> them help you get it out there. Uh, building on some of what uh, Dan said there, uh, yeah, definitely go to conventions. I've actually had several people tell me that they've gone to my live shows not knowing what the hell it was, and then becoming fans right away just from watching that. Uh, and just on a very basic level, not not even just Twitter and Reddit and Tumblr and Facebook, but if you like are a constant forum goer on some site about blenders or something, and you have a web series or a web I love that forum. Or, <laughs> Just blend right in. <laughs> put, in put in your forum signature. Uh, if you go to conventions, set up a booth. Promote yourself. You have to get yourself out there, get people knowing you are here, 
Come pay attention to me. Also, don't be a coward. Uh, there will be forums, certainly I have experienced this as we all have, where people will not like what you do. They will decide that they do not like you as a human being. Do not shut them down. Uh, if they're being dicks, full stop, ignore them. If they say, I fucking hate you because, take it on board. Not necessarily every time are they gonna say a thing that you agree with, but the fact of the matter is, people can be dicks and you can still learn from them, but you have to have a very thick skin. And that, being able to take uh, criticism, even when it doesn't come in a nice form, is gonna be absolutely key to your success. Now, you can't ignore what people help. say. You, you, have to, you have to be able to read the comments and listen to the comments and, and weigh what it is they said and if, how correct that is or not. Um, but yeah, don't respond to the people who are just being hateful for the sake of hate. It's best to just let them keep going because eventually they're going to look like fools anyway. So. Um, one of the things to kind of do with this is always be willing to be open to conversation. Obviously, don't feed the trolls. But, uh, you know, I find if you build a community via conversation, more people will come to you. And just, you know, be open. I mean, obviously, don't get like a thousand emails like Lewis. But to make yourself stick out, be a real person. That's one, that's one piece of advice I want to give very quickly. I mean, yeah, we made this all sound dire. but. There's a lot of really cool people out there. You meet some fantastic, I've met some people I've waited my entire life to talk to. So if you're excited and you genuinely care about what you're gonna do, it's gonna show in your eyes, in your voice, your mannerism, everything. And that will make you stand out because you're not trying to take advantage of a trend. You believe in yourself. And that's what will make you stand out. Okay, I gotta run too. Thank you everyone. Peace. Thank you. our panel. If you have additional questions about freelancing, music production, comic production, you can talk to me. You might even be able to talk to them. We all have booths. There's also the meet and greet room that anybody on this panel is free to go to, so um, they may be there. You just go around the corner and straight down the hallway. Panels 4 at 12.30. Brent and I will be talking about the comics, so if you have any interest in making a comic, we'll be talking extensively how we do it, the particulars. Again, we'll be talking about the business end as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'm going to be here all day.